Welcome everyone. Today we are doing another BGCC past paper review. Today we are reviewing a biology paper. This is a paper 2 from the year 2020. Now again, please remember before you start the examination, always write your school number, your candidate number, your surname, also your initials. Alright, again, please read through all the instructions carefully before you start the examination. And if you have any doubt or any queries, please clarify those with your examiner. Alright, we're going to go into the first question. And the first question reads that the diagram shows a flowering plant. And just to point out, we have A being the flower, B is the fruit, C is the leaf, D is the stem, and E is the soil. Or the portion below the soil will be the root. All right. So, the part A is a state the letter of the structure of the plant responsible for each of the following. And so, for photosynthesis, that will be the leaf. And so, that will be letter C. So, let's put C right here. All right. And for sexual reproduction, that is the flower. And so, the flower is at A, so let's put A right there. All right, so that's A. And then the next part, say so in which label structure would you find the following? And we have the palisade, and the palisade belongs inside of the leaf. So the palisade is in the leaf, so let's look where the leaf is. And so the leaf is option C. All right, so the leaf is C. Palisade is in the leaf. Remember that polysade is also the cells that contain the most chloroplasts, which means the most photosynthesis takes place in the polysade mesophyll cells. The seed is in the fruit, so the fruit is B. So B is the fruit. All right, and it's the pollen grains. Pollen grains are in the flower, and the flower is the first part that is A. All right. Now the next part is this part C. And part C wants to state the group of flowering plants to which this plant belongs. And if you look at the plant carefully, you're going to realize a number of features there. All right. And so look at the leaves, look at the flower, look at the type of roots. And you know that this belongs to dicotyledon. So this is a dicotyledon plant. All right. So that's a dicotyledon. It's a give one reason for your choice and there are a number of reasons why you what um, that you could choose for your answer right here and so one of them will be that they have um, broad leaves all right so broad leaves are there you can also include and again it's only one so i'm just giving you the different things that are shown there um, the leaves you also have branching leaf veins all right so we are branching leaf veins all right, and again, follow the instruction. He said one, so this one. I'm just giving the others. So just for studying purposes, of course. Um, you also have top roots. So there are top roots there. And the petals, if in, um, generally, I'm going to point this out on the, on the plant. Um, generally, we have um, four or five petals um, for dicotyledon plants, so four or five petals. But of course, inside of the flower, you're going to see right here that it is way more than five. But generally, you'd have um, five. So if you count this, it's about what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. All right, but that's fine. Um, once you have more than um, four or five, then you're good to say dicotyledon plant. Again, this is not even a real plant. If you notice it, that's just a drawing, all right? But once it's over four or five petals, then yes, it is a dicotyledon plant. All right, so. Part D now is that which term is used to describe the growth response to, um, to stimulus, to a stimulus in plants, and the growth response to stimulus in plants is called tropism. And also remember that in animals, which is the movement toward, um, to or away from stimulus, is called taxism. Just to put that in there. All right, so tropism is the term that is used. It's a state of response shown by the part E, the gravity, and E is the root system. All right, so E is the root system, and the root system responds to gravity um, in terms of geotropism. So this is called geotropism. Respond to gravity is geotropism, all right? Geotropism. 
All right, so the next part of the question here now is a name the hormone um, involved in this response, and the hormone here is auxing. All right, so auxing is a growth hormone in plants. All right, we have been through these already, so there's no need for me to really explain them. All right, so once you've been following the reviews, you should be good with that. All right, so question two. And for question two, here it said that impro uh, it said improper disposal of garbage on land can lead to land pollution. And here we have some diagrams um, or some different items. So we have uh, apple core, we have glass jar, we have a plastic water bottle, we have banana peel, we have soda can, and we have newspaper. And here's a define the term pollution. And by now you should be good with the, with the term pollution because we have been through this a number of times as well. So pollution is the process, the process by which the natural balance, and let's say natural balance of the environment, of the environment is being disturbed, okay? Natural environment is being disturbed. All right, so that's what pollution is, the process by which the natural balance of the environment is being disturbed. And of course, it's being disturbed by um, pollutants, okay? So pollutants are the substances that disturb the natural balance. And so we could have air pollution, land pollution, water pollution, noise pollution. So there are many different types of pollution. Once the natural balance of that environment has been disturbed, it is pollution. Now for part B, it states that the majority of the pollutants shown in the overflow garbage bin can be classified as biodegradable or non-biodegradable. It's a state the meaning of biodegradable. And this is a frequent question I realized from the day we've been through all the papers. And so to be biodegradable, it means that it can be broken down. Okay, it can be broken down by decomposers, by decomposers, or, or by natural means, okay? Or by natural means. So that's what biodegradable means. Bio means living, and degradable means to break down. Okay, so to break down by living organisms, which are called decomposers. All right, and here it said now, name one example of a biodegradable pollutant shown in the diagram. And if you look in the diagram carefully, what you're going to realize here, you have the apple core, banana, newspaper. Those are biodegradable. So let's quickly put those on. All right. So the biodegradable substance here will be our um, apple core. So apple core is one. Banana. Um, and that's the banana peel. Okay, so that's the banana peel. All right, so banana peel. And we also have a newspaper as well. All right, so newspaper is another one. So three of them there, you can, any of those three, you'll be good. It's a name and example of a non of a non biodegradable polyton shown in diagram. And there we have um three of them. We have here we have a the glass jar. Okay, so the glass jar is one. The plastic water bottle. So we have the plastic um water bottle that was there. And we also have in the diagram also a soda can. Okay, so soda can. So any of those um, three will work. And it's, again, it's only one. So again, follow the instructions. Don't not this all. I'm just doing this in terms of the practice and review. All right, so part C is a state two reasons why it is important to recycle materials. And a major one is to reduce waste, okay? So a reason to recycle materials is to reduce waste. All right, so to reduce waste all right and or not even just reduce waste also to prevent waste from piling up okay so reduce waste or prevent or let's say just to prevent um waste um from being piling up okay from being piled up all right so those are that's one reason there you're looking for two reasons right another possible Reason why we want to recycle is to reduce, uh, reduce 
creating, um, let's say, breeding grounds, creating breeding grounds, breeding grounds uh, for pests. And uh, when I say pest, I mean, for example, mosquitoes, rodents, all right? So you prevent those breeding grounds because they love to be in the garbage, especially mosquitoes in those canned waters. And of course, that could lead to diseases as well, such as dengue, malaria, and all those things. So of course, it could also prevent diseases, all right? Because once you do not have a lot of garbage piling up, you have less possibility of diseases, less possibility of diseases, less flies, less mosquitoes, um, less, less rodents, rats, all right? So definitely... Um, another one here, um, I'm going to put a, a, a third one you can put here as well, is that is to conserve natural resources. So once you recycle, also conserve, um, conserve natural resources or to conserve natural resources. All right, to conserve natural resources. All right, so that's another one there. Um, a fourth one, let me just give you one more and I, and I move on. Um, so another one, so this would be number four. Again, you, wanna, you only ask for two, but I just want to give you a number of things to help you with your confidence and your knowledge in terms of answering questions. All right, so it also reduces, um, to reduce pollution. So reduce pollution is another option. And um, reduce pollution, and if you reduce pollution, then you reduce um, global warming. So reduce, let's say, global warming. And global warming is a frequently asked question, or knowledge of global warming is a frequently asked one. All right, so I said I'm going to give you only one more, but just give you one more and then I move on. The last one, last one, I promise. So also it helps to save um, energy as well, all right, because instead of making um, the same thing over and over, you can save energy because once you recycle, there's no need to cre create, like, say, example, a glass bottle. You can use a glass bottle that already created with, the use of, of energy and just use that to make simple things that you'd otherwise go and buy and all of that. All right, so you really save energy to make things over and over and over. All right, so definitely. Uh, part D is that many landfill sites are associated with air pollution. There's a name two harmful gases produced by landfill sites, um, and, and for each gas state, one main effect it has on the environment. And by now, you should know. Most of these um, gases that are produced um, by landfill sites, um, we know sometimes it dumps on fire, and that is because of a special gas here called methane gas. Okay, you may pronounce it as methane. So methane, methane, same thing, right? So methane is a cause for global warming because it is a greenhouse gas, so it will lead to global warming. All right, so it's a greenhouse gas, and so it can cause global warming. And not only that, let me just give you this, it's not on the environment necessarily, but, also, but on us, uh, because methane you now will, will displace oxygen. Okay, so methane displaces oxygen. And of course, it can also effect, um, affect the environment as well, because if animals are not able to get oxygen, then they are part of the environment as well. So yes, but the, but the major effect here is that, and you notice in the question, in the statement, it said main effect. So the main effect is actually global warming, right? But I just wanted to let it also displaces um, um, oxygen. All right. Another gas here that is also common is carbon dioxide. All right. And you should know about carbon dioxide um, and, and, carbon, and the effect of carbon dioxide. And carbon, carbon dioxide is definitely, again, is global warming because it is a greenhouse gas. All right. And global warming is a, is a real thing. Notice the earth is becoming warmer and warmer summers. Are really hot, all right. Um, another effect of carbon dioxide. Let's give it a secondary effect right here. It also makes the um, the ocean acidic. So it makes uh, the ocean, all right, acidic, all right. Because once it dissolves in water, carbon dioxide dissolves in water, it forms an acid. All right. So yeah. So we covered that. So that's good right there. So let's jump on to the next question now. Are part of the question, whatever it might be. Okay, that's the end of that one. All right, so we're going to question number three. And here we have the diagram shows a human urinary system. All right, so it's a human urinary system. is a is a excretory system, a uh, part of the excretory system. And so here we have a, a little diagram there called X. 
or, or a structure called X. A matter of fact, let me quickly label this what X is. So in other words, X is below the urinary bladder. So X here is what they call a spincer muscle. Okay, so they call it um, spincer uh, muscle. All right, so spincer muscle. All right, and I will talk about I will talk about that a little bit. Uh, let's see if they ask about it first, because normally if they label it, that they're going to ask you something about it, right? Yes, yeah, so the kidneys now are part of the urinary system. Stay two functions of a kidney. All right, the main two functions of a kidney is, is one is that it serves as for excretion. So let's put excretion there. So it serves as for excretion, and how it does that is to remove waste. Okay, so for excretion by removing waste. Okay, um, so it remove they remove waste. They remove waste. Okay, and the waste that we're talking about here is nitrogenous waste, um, such as um, urea. To remove waste, uh, such as uh, urea, okay, um, salts as well. And let me just not put the next one there for a reason. I was going to put something there, but I will lock out myself in terms of giving another function. So the other function here is osmoregulation. Osmoregulation. All right, so if you have never heard about this term, osmoregulation is the process by which the body controls its water level. So the kidneys help to control or regulate water, okay? So osmoregulation is the control of water, okay? So control water level, okay? So control water levels in the body, all right? So the kidneys help us to do that. And that's why if, that's why if you notice um, on a hot day, you will sweat more and, and you urinate less. But on a cold day, you, you urinate more and you sweat less because, of course, the kidneys, um, especially at the collecting duct, will kind of regulate how much water is stored for urine and how much will be sent um, for sweating. All right, so yeah, those are the two major functions right there, all right? Now for part B, it's on the diagram, draw, draw lines to the following structures and name them. So we're going to look at the bladder, which is, I love to call it the urinary bladder. I prefer to call it the urinary bladder. And we have the ureter. So let's go back and label that. And it's a state of function of X. So let me just talk about the function of X first, which is the spin some muscle. Then I go back and label those two. All right. Since I'm right here, just to save some time. All right. So the, the, the function of the X, of the structure X, which is, which is a spin some muscle. So the spin some muscle now, they control, so they control the release, uh, the release of urine. So they control the release of urine from the urinary bladder, all right? From the urinary bladder, all right? So, and how it does that is really contract and relax, all right? Like any ordinary muscle, they contract relax to release urine. So when it is, um, when, the, when the bladder becomes um, filled with urine, then they will contract and then they release the urine from it, all right? So we're going to label two things here. They ask us to label the ureter and the urinary bladder. So I want to label them, so draw lines. So let's put my first line right here. All right, I will label that afterwards. I must draw the lines. And that is the urinary bladder right there. So here is the ureter. All right, so ureter. The ureter is this little piece down here. It's kind of short. Normally, it's longer, but don't worry about it. So this is a ureter. All right, so notice the difference there. They've got small things coming out. And that leads to the outside of the body. And then this is the urinary bladder. They just say bladder, so they just going to leave it bladder, right? So they don't have, yeah. I normally prefer to write urinary bladder, but they have bladder, so that's fine. All right. Uh, next part of the question, our next question. Let's quickly jump into that one. All right. So next part of the question here. It said that um, persons whose kidneys fail often receive treatment, which removes waste materials from their blood. So just like how the kidney will take away waste on the blood, the, the treatment also take away waste from the blood as well. They say, what name is given to this treatment? And this is called a dialysis. All right, so dialysis, dialysis, dialysis is the process. All right. So next um, part of question here is a name. Two substances which are removed from a patient's blood during this treatment. So remember now, the, 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 the dialysis... The dialysis machine is pretty much doing the same job as our kidney will do it, right? So the things that will remove from the blood, as the kidney will do it, because a replacement of a kidney technically, well, it is substitute for a kidney function. 
And so it will remove um, urea for sure because urea needs to be removed from the blood. Or you can say any nitrogenous waste. Okay, it says if you don't want to say um, urea, you can say nitrogenous um, waste. I'm going to put that right there. All right, so whether say urea or nitrogenous waste, it also removes some salt as well, right? And a, a matter of fact is that that's easy as I'm saying it because just remove them like that. No, it all goes through a process of osmosis and diffusion and all that. And then it's not only those other substances, but the other substances, but to keep it simple um, and, and, and basic according to the exam, then yeah, urea salts and water. The water is also removed as well, right? Some water must be removed as well. It is inevitable to remove water. All right, so those are the three things that you can have here, but it's... The two major ones you're talking about is urea and salts, all right? Um, part E of this question now, which is the last part, it said that the urinary system is one system of the human body. Name two other systems. It's like giving you free marks, isn't it? So we, we have a number of systems we could, leave, we, could, we could talk about. So we could name um, the circulatory system. All right, so the circulatory system. Um, we have... Um, the digestive system, all right, so digestive, all right, digestive, let me just put our next one right here, we have the respiratory system, all right, respiratory system, all right, we have um, endocrine, yeah, endocrine, and the endocrine is what deals with the hormones, all right, just to mention that, all right, and resp respiratory system is, is, well, the breathing system is a part of the respiratory system that provides the oxygen for the blood to for the blood to transport it to the cells for the cells to respire, right? And we also have, I said, okay, let's look at the next one. Nervous system. So we have the nervous system, digestive system, we have the muscular system. There are so many systems that we have in the body, right? Muscular system. We have the skeletal system. Skeletal system. All right, so the skeletal system. We have the immune system, all right? So the immune system. And one last one I'll put right here, and this one, just to make sure that um, at least you get familiar yourself with it, is the integumentary system. So the integumentary, the integumentary system, and the integumentary system deals with the skin, okay? All right, so this deals with the skin. All right. Right, so integument here, that is spelled correctly. I-N-T-E-G-U-M-E-N-T-A-R-Y. Yeah. So the inter integumentary system, that is definitely deals with the, with the skin, all right? Or the outermost part of the body itself, all right? Which include the hair on your skin and all of those things. But the skin is general. All right, so that's the question is out of the way. We're halfway now. This is question number four. Halfway through. All right, so this diagram now shows a specialized cell found in plant. All right, and everybody should know what this cell is now. And so we have different parts of cell. Right? Quickly, let's label them real quick. Um, let's start with X. All right, the entire thing is called a root here cell. Okay, the entire thing is called a root here cell. But X itself, that part is the root here. Okay, that portion, X, is a root here, but the entire thing is called a root here cell. Just to mention that. All right, this, this here is one, two, three. Is the second layer in. Okay, so this is a cell membrane here. So this is a cell membrane. All right. All right, that's kind of messy. Uh, let me see if I could put it down to the bottom. Yeah. So cell membrane. All right. Cell membrane. Okay, cool. That looks better now. And then B. Uh, let's label B. Come on. All right, there now. Here we go. So B now is the outer one. So this is the cell wall. All right, just like any other plant cell. And C is a very important structure in plant cell. And notice it's very large. So C you now is a vacuole. All right, so that's a vacuole. D is a nucleus. All right, it's a nucleus. All right, and E will be um, between the, the vacuole and the cell membrane. That is the cytoplasm. All right, cytoplasm. So it's a regular cell, yeah? All right. Now let's go down to uh, now answer the question. So can I remember the letters there and uh, know the structures? It says state the name and function of the cell shown in the diagram. So the name and function of the cell. So the entire cell, as I mentioned, is the root here cell. Okay. 
So this is the root hair cell. All right. And the function of it is really to absorb water and mineral salts. That's the major function of it. Is to absorb, to absorb, right? So to absorb water and mineral salts. All right. All right. Cool. All right. So for two easy marks, I'll think. All right. So let's go to the next part. Now we said complete the table by selecting the letter A to E that matches the description. And it said, um, contains genetic material which controls the cell activities. And uh, once you see that controls cell activities and contains gen genetic material, you know it's the nucleus. Because the nucleus contains um, DNA and chromosomes and so on, particularly DNA, right? And so the nucleus is D, so let's put D right there, all right? So D is the nucleus. The next part is it controls what enters and leaves the cell. That is cell membrane. Let's look, 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 look what it, um, where the cell membrane is. The cell membrane is A. All right, so we get that as A. And the next one now said that stores the storage site for water and minerals, and that's the vacuole. The vacuole is the storage compartment of cells, and that is C. All right, so it's D, A, C. All right, so let's go back up. So you see all three of them there. All right, so it's DAC, okay? All right, so the last part now of this question is to describe how X or structure X aids the cell in carrying out its function. Now, I want to be very specific and keen with this part, right? Oh, X. You know what X is again? Let me just show you what X is. X is what they call a the root here, okay? So look at it carefully. Root here, which is um, X, not the entire cell, but it helps the cell. Notice the structure X, how it looks, yeah? All right, so once we understand how structure X um, looks, then we can now talk about how it um, assists with this cell in carrying this function. That's what they actually ask you. Yeah. All right, so X itself now, two major things with X. It's long thing and, well, three things I, I said. Uh, so let's put it right here. X is um, thin, long, and narrow. All right, you know what? Let me, let me put them on the bottom and explain them. But the, but the general thing here is that it increases the surface area. It I'm, I'm gonna talk about the three uh, the three features, right? It increases the surface area, okay? Increases the surface area uh, for effective. Let's say for effective or maximum. If you wanna say maximum is also fine for effective absorption, okay? So effective absorption of water. All right, for the extra Absorption of water and mineral salts, all right? All right, so yes. So that is it, is it how it, um, or the structure helps. It's to increase the surface area to absorb water and mineral salt. Now, I want to be specific with this. And you can also add this with this question because there are two more questions so you can explain this. So it's long for one. So I'm going to put, let me put a, st a stick right there. So it is long for one. And the length of it, because it's so long, what, is, what, it, the, the, what it aids with is that it increased surface area. The length of it is what is called the increased surface area, right? Okay, so long, it increased surface area. And next thing again about it is that it is thin. And when structures are thin and they're absorbing things that also is easy, easy absorption, let's say this is equal to easy absorption, okay? So easy absorption, all right, I missed out the B right there, all right, absorption, all right, cool. And then here now, it's also narrow. So there are three major things about this that make it effective is that it is long, thin, and narrow. And because it's narrow, I know this is also pointing at, at the end as well, it helps to penetrate the soil. So penetrate the soil easily, all right, so penetrate um, the soil easily okay so those are special features of the root here itself that will assist the entire root here cell in carrying out all this function long to increase surface area thin for easy absorption narrow to penetrate the soil easily all right and especially going through the particles of the soil yes narrow is very important so it's like the pointy and like a knife going through or a chisel yeah a chisel going through the soil yeah all right, so this is the end of that. No, this no. Okay, this is part D. No, 
It said water enters this cell by osmosis, the final osmosis. All right, so I think all of you must be masters now in defining osmosis. And remember, the osmosis deals with the movement of water, right? So you must mention the movement of water. If you do not mention that, they can't get a mark. All right, so everything else is going to be wrong. So it is going to say the movement. Um, so the movement of water molecules, right? And um, let me just say, let me just say movement put in bracket here, diffusion. And I'm going to say this in a special way because, I mean, we have been defining osmosis so many times, but no one to put, include the word diffusion in osmosis, right? I'm going to tell you why um, shortly. So the diffusion or movement of water, of water molecules from a higher concentration to a lower concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. All right, so it's the movement of water molecules from a higher concentration to a lower concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. All right, so that's cover osmosis. And I, I put in the word diffusion now because we, we usually define osmosis without even including diffusion. But diffusion is, is the movement of substance from higher to lower concentration, right? But osmosis is a special type of diffusion. It's a diffusion of water molecules. You do not need to put the word diffusion in it. I just want to include it in it to explain that osmosis is a type of diffusion. But it's a diffusion of water and it must diffuse across a semi-permeable membrane. All right, just to give you some variety in terms of definition because... Uh, typically, in previous lessons with I or reviews, I don't diffuse or diffusion in it. But yes, if you see it, don't be surprised that you, you know, it's a form of it. All right, so let's go to part E here. It said, the plant cell in the diagram is a eukaryotic cell. Bacteria are prokaryotic cells, right? It's a state one difference between eukaryotic um, cell and prokaryotic cell. For me, when I'm doing... Again, as I, I encourage you, once you're doing these exams and it's a difference, you can always put a chart. This is one difference. You don't need a chart, right? But I'm going to give you more than one differences. So um, let's just uh, put a chart first. So let's put prokaryotic cell right here. Okay. So prokaryotic. So I'm just giving you this extra thing just in case, you know, when, uh, when at least when in the exam and if you need it, at least you understand the difference here. So prokaryotic and let's put eukaryotic all the way over here. All right, so I'm going to show you a difference now. So eukaryotic. All right, so we have prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, right? And what I'm going to do is a, you can put a line as well if you want, you know, to you know, make it look nice and neat. So you use a ruler to draw a line, for example. If you ask for more than one differences, you could do that. There's no problem in doing that. All right, and then now let's talk about the differences. All right, so the difference is here. All right, let's even change the color here. You know? so, okay, let's put this in red. All right, so for prokaryotic cells, they are, they, are, they, are, they are simpler cells. So they are simpler cells. All right, so they are much um, simpler, okay? Much, 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 much simpler cell. They are very simpler, simpler cell. Um, the eukaryotic cells, no, they are more complex. So they are more complex, the so more complex. All right, another difference here is that the prokaryotic cells have no nucleus, are no true nucleus. Let me put the word true nucleus, no true nucleus. They are something that they call nucle uh, nucleoid, okay? So no true nucleus. Instead, they have what's called nucleoid. And that's just an area, really. It's not really a structure, a structure per se, because the only thing you find is a, is a circular DNA. Okay, so in this one, now we have nucleus, okay? So eukaryotic now has nucleus, all right? It has a nucleus. All right, so the next point here, now we can give up. I'm, as, I said, as I said before, I'm also going to give you some, some differences, so just, you know, just in case. You may need them, need them on the exam, I don't know. All right, so organelle. Let's talk about organelle now. So organelles um, are not membrane-bound, so they don't have membrane around them, really. So they're not membrane-bound. All right. However, now, for prokaryotic, now, the organelles are membrane-bound. All right, so organelles. All right. Organelles. 
are membrane bound. Alright, that's all right, that's gonna be in the way. But anyway, uh membrane bound, at least you see the first word, so that'll be fine. Just the opposite, so there's another problem with that. So organelles are membrane bound. Um, next one here that another one here is that DNA, the DNA structure are circular. All right, so DNA is circular. I can just say circular DNA. And for eukaryotic cells now, the, the, the DNA is um, linear. So you have a linear DNA. DNA is the linear form, okay? Um, another one I should put here, which is kind of, well, it's not the same as simpler. Um, but here, it is normally, prokaryotic cells are normally smaller, okay? So they are normally smaller cells. And for eukaryotic, they're normally larger cells. All right, so eukaryotic cells are like bacteria cells and archaea. And eukaryotic cells are like multicellular organisms. And generally in multicellular organisms, so like us, animals, plants, and so on, right? All right, let's jump on to the next question. And this is question number five. All right, so we have three more questions to do after this, right? All right, so here now we have some special apparatus. We have P, Q, and R. And let's quickly label, label what P is. So P is a butterfly net. or just say net. So the net or butterfly net, okay? So net or butterfly net. Um, what this is called is a, called a pitfall trap. This is a pitfall trap, all right? And this here is a quadrat, all right? So it's a quadrat. All right, so we're going to talk about these um, down the line. And I'm sure you're going to ask some questions and we'll have to explain something here. All right, so complete the table by giving the letter and name of the apparatus that is best suited for carrying out each task. So let's say that, yeah, you did not know the names of, um, of these apparatus. Let's say you didn't know the names, right? So it's a collecting a sample of crawling insects. By looking at the diagram carefully, I mean, with all means, right? With all means, you can notice it. And notice even see earthworm here. And you notice it be on the, on the, on the ground. There's a ditch. Notice inside of it, it's a small insect inside of it as well. Or an organism. Not necessarily insect, but it's an organism is in there. So that will give a giveaway right there. That, that the crawling, crawling insect has to be Q. All right? So you may get the, the, the names wrong, but at least you get the letters correct. That would be awesome. So, you know, not, not, that they, not that they want to get something wrong now, but I'm just saying, you know, it's easier to gain some marks. They just use some um, knowledge and are just kind of reason through it out um, and get the answer. Just be smart. All right. So here now, as I said, this is a pitfall trap, right? The pitfall trap. All right. So this is determine the, determine the population density of a small, of, sorry, of snails in a given area. And this is the quadrat with this R. And it's not only for snails alone, but any um, organisms that move very slow or, or Im immotile organisms, like small plants. Yeah, you can use a quadrat and do that. The, the, the quadrat will not be good for, for um, organisms that move very fast, right? Because as I as a, as a toss the, the quadrat randomly, then any organism that move very fast will move away, right? And you will get to count them within the quadrat. So it's for um, slow moving or immotile organisms. And again, this is quadrat. So, yeah. So it's a quadrat. And collecting sample of flying insect, definitely it is P, and that is a butterfly net. Or you can, so there actually is a net. You can just say net. Or you can say butterfly net. Okay. So you can say the butterfly net is also called butterfly net. And there's another name that they give to it again. It's called, um, yeah, the aerial um, insect net. So it's called, also called the aerial insect net. Um, net, all right? So the aerial insect net. And the word aerial is really mean in the atmosphere, in the air, all right? So they are flying, aerial flying, okay? All right, so any of those three names um, should work. All right, so next question here now. is the photograph shows a Bahamian endangered species. This is a Bahamian parrot, a Bahama parrot. Is a state, the meaning of the term endangered. To be endangered, you are at risk. So at, it means at risk. Let me change this back to blue. So this means at risk or threatened. So it being at risk or threatened of becoming, let's say, of 
becoming extinct. Okay? All right. So, yeah. So, that's definitely what endangered mean. You're threatened to become extinct or on the verge of becoming extinct. That means that mean you're, you're being threatened to be in non-existence in a very short while. That is if, that is if measures are taken in place. So, if you continue on the same trend, yes, the organism might become extinct in the near future. All right, so for this one now, we said the, pop, uh, the table shows the population of this species between 1940, sorry, 1994 and 2016. All right, and then it's, you give the years here, and they give the numbers here. So this is under 2,000, 4,000, and 8,000. And so here now it's asked what happened to the size of the population between the year 1994 and 2016. And by looking at the the chart, obviously, it increased, okay? So there's an increase in population. So it increased. All right. And it's a suggest a reason for your, for your answer to be two. So why it increased, why there was an increase, I guess that's what they're actually, actually asking you. It's not why you choose increase or because the numbers are showing a larger number. It's not that. Um, so suggest a reason why there's an increase in this population. So there's a number of different things you can actually talk about here. So one of them um, could have been that yeah, enforcement of laws. That's a, that's a nice one. Enforcement of protected laws. They say protected laws, right? So you protect the organism of protected laws. So any law to protect the, the organism may be enforced. Another one here is that it could be um, education or awareness. So increase in education. It increase in education or awareness. You can just put increase or awareness um, of the importance of its importance, right? Um, I'm talking about the endangered species of its importance um, to the environment, right? All right, so that could be a, another one. So people become more aware of it so they don't capture it or you know, they don't catch it, catch it for food. And another thing that is possible right here to make the number increase is it can be a reduction in natural predator. Okay, so a reduction of predators, all right, so reduction of predators, which include human beings too, because if you, if you like to eat parrot, you know, to make like bird soup or to fry the birds, whatever, whatever you like birds, I don't know. But you can be a predator, and if you stop eating them because you become more aware, then yeah, naturally the population will go to increase, right? And let's say they, they are eaten by domestic cats, and so um, people may have less cats on the island or where they are found, then definitely the population will increase of, after a while. All right, so part C. Here, you know, we said that name two important marine resources in the Bahamas. And trust me, we have a lot. There are a lot you can put here. The, one of them that most people will just want to write first is the conch. Sweet, savory conch, you know? Yeah. Your conch fritters, you know, your, your conch salad, wow, you know, conch chowder, mmm, lovely. All right, so let's not get too much watering right now. Oh, yes, yeah, spiny lobster is another one here. So spiny lobster, and, you know, imagine that lobster in that butter. Oh, Lord. All right, so yeah, so spiny lobster, um, I'm thinking of food right now. So, wow. Uh, the Nassau grouper, and who, and who don't love a, 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 a group of finger, oh, a group of finger dinner. Mm. Talking about fish fry. All right, um, another one here could be snapper. Yep, and trust me, a lot of, a lot of people will go to fish fry to get the yellowtail snapper. And let's put yellowtail right there. Um, not to be prejudiced, but I love yellowtail. Oh, my God. Yellowtail is, oh, wow. Especially squeeze that um, lemon on it. Oh, my. Mm, some nice sauce. All right, anyhow, yeah, I'm getting over myself. Part two. Part two. He said, discuss two, two threats to the population of marine resources in the Bahamas, and there are so many. Um, if any one of you have been on brief field trips, let me just put brief right here. It's a, it's, it's a non-profitable organization, and brief, um, they do a lot of field trips for high school, so if... You have, not, you have not been on a field trip, trust me, check out Brief or even Bahamas National Trust. Yeah, or BNT. So let's put BNT here, Bahamas National Trust. So check them out. 
for your field trips. And believe me, you'll have fun time in the mangroves, snorkeling. Oh, yes, they, they have been doing a, an, an awesome job in exposing students to um, different ecosystems and conservation practices. And if you have been to any of their field trips, they will tell you this. You, have, you must have heard this at least once. Chop, um, choppy, all right? But I don't put chopping, all right? So I think one of them said choppy and one said chopping. But anyway, they come from them. Um, I, I can't be sure who actually came up with the, with the term, but I've heard it on the presentation. So I'm going to put them right here. So chop, choppy or chop in. Um, that's how I remember it. All right, I I might be a little bit off, but yeah, but I know it's choppy for sure. They they say choppy for sure, but I'm gonna put chop in. I think one said chop in, one said choppy. And once I remember this acronym, you're straight. So C is for climate change. So climate change is a is a threat, and climate change could be for many reasons: global warming, all those different type of stuff. It could be pollution, all those things. We call it N. Now would be habitat destruction, destruction of habitat. How do we destroy the habitat? It could be um, in terms of construction, building hotels, building um, homes, um, dredging. All of those things could be habitat destruction, right? All right. So habitat destruction is a, is a threat. Um, o is overfishing. And this is for marine organisms as well if you overfish. So overfishing is also another one there. And P, which is a very big one on the list, is pollution. So some of us... Um, some, some of us really, really, I'm going to say careless in dumping our garbage. We dump our garbage anywhere and anyhow. And even our, our so, um, sewage in the ocean as well is, uh, is really a nasty thing. But yeah, and then I know is invasive species. And invasive species, for example, the lionfish. Yeah? So invasive species, especially the lionfish, is a big threat. And another one here is natural means. And uh, natural means... Yeah, natural means is good, but let us put natural disaster. The natural disaster or natural means, right? Or natural means. Uh, uh, I missed something here. Okay, yeah. Disaster or natural means, right? And put natural means. So N could be natural disaster or natural means. Um, so natural means could be like diseases and so on. Okay, natural means. Yeah, so it still work out. Um, to be chopping, yeah, that's that's solid. All right, so chopping, yeah. All right, so go moving on to the next question now. Moving on to the next question now. Number six is the enzymes are important substances used in the process of digestion. All right, it's a describe the function of enzyme of an enzyme. All right, so the the, the, the function of enzymes generally is to speed up. Let's say here. Um, uh oh, where, where am I typing? I missed something. Okay, let's go back here. I didn't know what happened. Okay, yeah. All right, right here. All right, I think my cursor was somewhere else. All right, so here to speed up, to speed up, I'm going to put in bracket alter, um, which is mean change, to speed up the, the, the rate of chemical reaction, to speed up the rate or alter the rate of chemical reactions, chemical reactions in the body. That's important, in the body. All right, so it's the alter speed rate of chemical reactions in the body without, let me put this here, without being changed. Or, yeah, without being changed, right? Without being changed. All right, so that's the function of enzymes, is really to speed up chemical reactions in the body. Or, better yet, a simpler way to say it, let me put it on top right here. A very simplified way to say it is to catalyze, is to catalyze, um, is a catalyzed chemical reaction, chemical reactions in the body. Huh? So that's why um, enzymes are called biological catalysts because they catalyze chemical reactions in the body, which means they work in the body without themselves being used up. So they work as catalysts, but they work in the body or in living things, and that's why they're called biological because they work in living things. And again, they are proteins, right? And protein is a basic living structure. All right, so part B now is to state the probable effect of high temperature on human digestive enzymes. Once temperature increases to a certain point, then the effect on the enzymes that the enzyme will become um, denatured. 
enzymes become denatured. All right, so they become denatured. All right, they become, let me just say, they. All right, so they become denatured, which means their shape and structure changes. Um, their shape and structure will change, I should say. And then when the, 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 cha the shape change, then what happened is that they cannot have an indial shape to fit the substrate. So they no longer could fit the, the substrate or food to cause a reaction. All right, so lock and key um, pattern is no longer existing. All right, a so part of this is so what effect does this change in part B1 of the activity of enzymes? So once this change takes place, the activity will slow down or stop. All right, so let's say the activity, the activity will slow down or stop. Okay, definitely. So if it denature to a point, it's going to stop. If it is slowly denaturing, yeah, they're going to start slowing down, right? All right, now for part three, it's in addition to temperature, name one other factor that affects the rate of enzyme activity. And so another factor that affects enzyme activity right here could be pH. Okay, so pH, I know, remember that pH is a lowercase p, uppercase h, right? So pH is one. Concentration, and concentration could be two things. Concentration of the enzymes or concentration of the, of the substrate. All right, so concentration also affects that. Also poison. Um, so poisons and poisons are what they call inhibitors, okay? All right. All right, so inhibitors. So poison or or inhibitors. Okay. Next um part of question, part C. Here now we said that lipase is a digestive enzyme um, that breaks down fats. Describe the role of bile in the uh, of bile in in the breakdown of fat. So how bile work in the breakdown of fat or what is the role of bile? And so what bile is doing is to emulsify the fat, okay? So bile um, emulsify fat, let's say to emulsify um, fat, all right? And so when it emulsify fat, what it does um, by breaking it down, by breaking down fat into smaller um, pieces, in the smaller pieces. All right, so that's what it does in the smaller pieces. And we call these smaller pieces fatty droplets. I so put fatty droplets in bracket into fatty um, droplets. All right, so that's what bile does. Those break down the smaller portions in the fatty droplets. And the purpose for this um, is to cause, all right, so let's say now um, this will enable lipase to work more effectively all right so make lipase work more effective effectively why because once you break down fats in the fatty droplets what they create is a larger surface area all right work effectively let me just put that in work effectively due to an increase in surface area right due to an increase in surface area Right, yeah. So breaking down fat in the fatty droplets, it increases surface area. All right. So instead of having a big chunk of fat, you have smaller portions that the lipase can penetrate easier and faster. Okay, so that's a function of bile. It's a name the organ that produces bile, and bile is produces but bile is produced by the liver. All right, and I guess we all remember that by now. For part three, it said name one group of digestive enzyme other than lipase and state the name of the nutrient it breaks down. All right, so I'm gonna put this in a general way, okay? So let's bear me now and put this in a general way. And so here you could put any of the proteases. So let's say proteases right here, right? So proteases, and what you can actually write is one of these. So example of the proteases, I think what you can actually write is pepsin. You can say pepsin, or you can say trypsin, okay? So pepsin or trypsin, and pepsin or trypsin um, break down uh, proteins, so the acupon proteins, right? Okay, cool. Now, um, and also make the, if matter of fact, I could go even more specific because pepsin breaks down the protein in the polypeptides, right? And then trypsin, now, which are produced inside of the inside of the pancreas, will work on the polypeptides and turn them out, and turn them into amino acid eventually in the small intestine, right? So we can also be specific, but you need to know. Um, the different enzymes and how they actually work. And the group I'm going to put right here, um, again, just for the purpose of knowledge, 
is what they call carbohydrates. And again, I'm going general, so carbohydrates. And we have a number of different carbohydrates, okay? We have a number of different types of carbohydrates. Um, and they break down generally here is the breakdown carbohydrate, okay? So they break down carbohydrates. All right, so some example of carbohydrates that you need to know, or else at least pay attention to, is we have, for example, amylase. And we have two types of amylase. Um, we have salivary amylase that breaks down starch, salivary amylase, and can salivary amylase that breaks down starch. We have also pancreatic amylase that will work upon maltose in, and break down maltose into glucose. We also have maltase. So maltase is another type of carbohydrates. I know example ASE. So maltase breaks down maltose, okay? Maltase breaks down maltose. All right, so the sugar is OSE. The, the enzyme is ASE. So maltase, maltose. Another one here, just, as, just for information purposes, you have sucrase. So sucrase breaks down sucrose. Okay, so notice the difference between the A and the O. And let's put one last one and move on. You have lactase. So lactase. And lactase breaks down lactose. Okay, so those are the enzymes and those are the sugar. And sugars are carbohydrates, right? So carbohydrates are the general term for those um, enzymes that break down carbohydrates. Proteases are those are the general is a general name for the enzymes that break down proteins. All right, all right, and these are some um, specific examples here. All right, so let's go to the next question now. So this question is actually finished. All right, so here now question number seven. Then we have one more question to go, and we out of here. All right, so the diagram shows a human heart. And this human heart, now we have two labels structured here. We have Q and we have R. All right, before I go into this, let me just quickly remind you about something, right? And I hope this will help you. If, if not, you can go back to circulation and one of my lessons and you will see it. So I want to remember AV, AV, okay? And then we'll separate L, L, AV again, B. So this is called AVLAV B, okay? So AVLAV B, which I like to call it, is an easy way to know circulation right and so let me just put something here now um let's put this in red all right so b is body all right so it will move from the body all the way back to this side of the heart right and this side of the heart here if you put your left hand up so this will be the right side of the heart right? let's put r right there that's the right side all right i don't know this writing so bad r yeah and this is this side here is the left side of the heart put up your right hand this is the left side of the heart so a is the Atrium, V is the ventricle, L is lungs, B is the body, right? So, so blood is circulating in this manner. From the right side of the heart into the lungs, and then from the lungs back in the left side of the heart, then back into the body. And as we know that, as I mentioned, we said that A is the atrium. So from the body into the right atrium, then the right ventricle, from the right ventricle into the lungs, from the lungs into the left atrium, from the left atrium into the left ventricle, then back, in the, back into the body. And the circulation continues. And of course, you need to know the name of the blood vessels. Now, the blood vessels that come in from the heart, those are arteries. The one that go into the heart, those are veins. All right, so arteries away. And so based on the diagram up there, this is coming into the body. So since it's coming into the body, then this is our vena cava. Okay, so this is our vena cava. All right, and then R now will be our aorta. Okay, aorta. All right, so that's our aorta right there. All right, so aorta. All right, and let's now go to the other parts of the question now and see exactly what they're asking us. All right, so on the diagram above, draw a line to a valve and name it. Okay, so this diagram here only showing two different valves. So on this side here, um, on the interest of time, let's quickly, all right, let me just draw the line and then label it real fast. So one valve right here and another valve on this side. All right, so let's label both of them real quick. All right, so I'm trying to rush this through now to finish. So this side here is what they call the bicuspid. So this is a bicuspid. All right, the bicuspid. Bicuspid or what they call mitral valve, right? The bicuspid or mitral valve. And then this one now will be the tricuspid valve. Okay, the tricuspid valve. All right, so for part A now, it states that 
Um, on the diagram above, draw the draw a line to a valve. Okay, we'll, we'll answer that part. I think I'm trying to go too fast now. All right, so part two is to describe the function of valves. The function of valves is really to prevent the backflow of blood, okay? So here is to prevent, to prevent the, to prevent the backflow of blood. Okay, to prevent the backflow of blood. All right, so prevent the backflow of blood and not only that, prevent the backflow of blood and also to allow blood to flow in one direction. Uh, so let's put this as uh, secondary right here. The, any of them work um, to allow blood to flow in one direction. All right, so that's what it is. All right, so when you don't know, uh, I'm going to just say state the name of blood vessel Q and R, and, and we already, already um, label those. So Q is the vena cava of the mention. So Q is the vena cava, and R is the aorta. Okay? All right. So we already labeled those up top. All right. So part two now, we said draw one arrow inside both vessel, inside both vessels, Q and R, to show the direction of blood flow. All right. So I'm just quickly go back up. And do that real quick. And so again, remember the vena cava takes blood from the body, as we mentioned in the Avlav B. So if we go back in the Avlav B, um, blood is going from the body into, into the vena cava, which is this side here. So on this side, you're going to have it going inwards, like that. Okay, going in. And on this side, you're going to have the blood coming outside of the aorta towards the body. So it'll come out like that, okay? So that's the direction of blood flow in both parts. All right. So let's go down to the next part of the question now so we can hurry and finish up. All right. All right. There's a name, a common cause of heart disease. And so there are many different causes of heart disease or possible uh, common causes. So we have um, high blood pressure, which is hypertension. So I'm going to put that number here. Let's start this right here. So let's say high blood pressure. High blood pressure pressure and this is the same thing as hypertension all right so high blood pressure hypertension um we have high cholesterol as well okay so high cholesterol high cholesterol we also have let me put another one down here your diet is other cause as well all right um genetics could be another one the genetics, yes, based on the genetic makeup. Um, another one here is obesity. All right, so that's another cause right there. Obesity is a cause. And diabetes could also trigger heart disease as well. All right, yeah. So those are some of the common um, causes of heart disease. And here now we said um, discuss two lifestyle changes a person could make to have a healthier heart. So... One here is to eat less, um, eat less fatty food, um, eat less fatty foods. Another one you can do is to consume less salt because too much salt could lead, could lead to high blood pressure. So consume uh, less salt. All right. Another one that you can have here is to exercise. All right. So you want to exercise um, frequently. Exercise frequently or regularly, not just exercise one day and stop, but keep doing it. And another one here that most people will not think about, I'm going to put this right here, most people do not think about this one, and it is positive outlook on life. Positive. And you may wonder how this helps your heart, but I'm going to tell you why. It's a positive outlook on life. I'm just giving this one as a really, as an encouragement as well, right? It's not necessarily for you to really put on the exam, but yeah, of course, you can put it on it to explain it, because I discuss it. But a healthier or a positive outlook on life, it make you happier. So live happy. Okay, live happier. Instead of stressing yourself over things, and I use the word stress, um, stop stressing over things. Stop creating this unnecessary um, notion on life. Stop being depressed. Because when you're depressed, it affects your hormone levels. It affects your heartbeat. It affects, it affects your blood pressure as well. And of course, eventually, because of high blood pressure, you keep on stressing yourself, elevating your blood pressure, um, consistently, then may affect the heart over time, how your heart actually beat and how your heart actually work. 
And eventually you may even realize that the heart fails easier. So persons who are sad generally tend to have higher chance of heart attack. All right? Yeah, because it's built up of anger, this excessive thinking about negative things. Please, just think positively. Live happier. Live longer. But being happier alone is not, the, is not going to prevent you from having heart diseases. You must do the other um, things as well. So a combination of things that you must do to, mensure, to ensure that you have a healthy heart. All right? So yes, please live positive. Please live right. Just be free and be good to yourself and to others too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that helps your heart, you know. Yeah, love. Love is the key. All right, number eight. Let's just get over myself here. Number eight, last question. It's a defined term, germination. And germination is simply the process, the process by which. So this is going to say the process by which um, seeds, uh, by which seeds turn into, uh, turn into a seedling. Or turn into seedlings. Or let's say, I want to go there. Uh, turn into seedlings. So, germination is the process by which seeds turn into seedlings. And seedlings are what they call a self supporting plant, right? So, they are self um, supporting plant. They can support themselves. So, self supporting um, plants. All right. So, that's what germination is. So, when one seed turns into a plant, yeah, simply. Or seed turn, or seed turn into um, seedlings, yes. Is a state to environmental conditions ne- um, needed for a seed to germinate. There are more than two things needed, so I'm going to list all of them. So here you must have the, uh, let me put about four things in each, so let me put on each line. So you must have the correct, um, you must have the correct temperature. You must have the correct temperature. You must have uh, oxygen, so I'll put available oxygen. Okay, so available, available oxygen you must have adequate water so let's put adequate water i right, said so not too much water and not too little water but the right amount of water is needed and you must ensure that there's optimal ph all right and um just to make a point here when say um correct temperature because some seeds will germinate in in, in cooler temperature some seeds um germinate in Higher temperatures. All right, so depends on the seed. Now, the next part of the part is the table below shows data collected from an investigation into the effect of salt concentration and the growth of the radical in pigeon peas. All right, so those are the numbers right there, if you notice them. And here now it asks here that state the function of the radical. So, what is the function of the radical? The radical is what forms the root. Okay. So the radical um, will form, uh, forms the root. So it forms the root, providing, providing anchorage. So provide anchorage. All right. Uh, so provide anchorage for the seedling. For the seedling. Okay. Provide anchorage for the seedling. As well as to absorb water. So once it, when the seed germinates, it will end up absorbing water as well. So it's what they call an embryonic root. Okay, so it comes out of a seed, creates some anchorage, and absorb water. Not just water alone, but mineral salt as well. So water and mineral salt. Let me add that piece in. Water and um, mineral salt. So anything the plant will need after it's germinate, yeah, the radical form the root, and that will happen. Now, the next question now is said that, um, let me see what this is saying. Yeah, I already done this, so this part is skipped out while I draw this. It's a plot a gra- put a line graph to show salt concentration against length of radical. I'm going to point this out. I've made an adjustment to this statement, right? Because length, it said concentration against length. That means length should be on the x-axis and concentration on the y-axis. Now, please bear this in mind. I've made an adjustment and put concentration on the x and length on the y because the length here is a independent variable and you put independent variable on the y-axis. Now, I'm not going against the exam or what they actually wanted to do, but I'm, I did it this way for easier viewing. So if you have followed the instruction on the exam, your graph should turn sideways. 
So if you turn the page sideways, that's how your graph should look. But I turn mine the other way because I know that length is independent, should be on the y-axis, and concentration is dependent. Sorry, um, concentration is the independent variable, should be on the x-axis, and length is the dependent variable, should be on the y-axis. So I just change mine uh, to make it proper in terms of what is independent and dependent variable. But again, they might know why they want you to turn it sideways. Okay, so your graph will be the opposite way. Instead of being mine, mine is vertically um, inclined. If you notice it, yours will be sideways. Just to point it out again, I'm not going against the examination and what they asked us to do. I just want to present it this way for you to see a better understand, uh, for you to have a better understanding of the changes in terms of what is happening. So by looking at that graph, you'll realize that. Uh, let me just drop this on a little bit so you're going to see it better. Let's put this to say about 100. All right, yeah, so that should be easier to see now. All right, so if you notice on the graph popping up, uh, yeah, what you will see on the graph is that there's an actual increase in the line coming from the zero. So it'll be gradually increasing, coming from the zero and going all the way up and then start to decrease again, right? So you, you should have seen that on your graph. So mine is a little bit different from yours, as I mentioned, right? Yours a little bit different from mine. All right, so notice again the increase or the decrease in the figure. So notice the line graph. All right, so mine increase, then decrease this way vertically. Yours will be horizontal, but it's the same thing, all right? So I just want to point that out for you. Again, to get your four marks, please label your axis. Please label your axis. Please use small points. Please make your lines as smooth as possible. They are looking out for those things, please. All right, next thing here now, part three is a state there. State the, op the optimum salt concentration for the radical um, growth in the pigeon peas. And if you look at the graph, you're going to realize that this is definitely at 2. The, the, the graph will tell you it's going to be at 2. That's the highest peak. And not only be at, you can even look at the table as well. You're going to see it. So it's going to be 2.0. So it's going to be 2.0 milligrams per dm cube. Okay? So per dm cube. All right. So you're going to see that on, on the chart as well. All right. Okay, my numbers were missing off the thing. Let me just try to pop, pop them back in. All right. So you have the concentration there. All right. So I'm just trying to pop them back in. All right. Okay. I realized they were missing. Okay, great. So that's how it graph will look. Um, again, but yours will be a little bit different from mine. All right. Yours, again, is horizontally orientated. Mine is vertical based on how I changed this. So the last thing to, and we, and we finish here now, is a state what happens to the length of the radical in salt concentration above um, two. So once you go above two, the radical will decrease. So there is a decrease in the radical. All right, so folks, um, this is end of it. So please stay safe. Please do well, study hard, and I'll catch up with you soon. All right, take care. Bye.